Hey, welcome to this live stream. It's cool to see you on. Uh, Sergey, very cool. Thanks for joining. And uh, we're going to be talking about some good music theory tonight. Keen Music, very cool. I'm glad to see you here. Dave, we are going to geek out about relationships. <laughs> and it's not me, it's you. Is I'm going to weave that into our discussion of intervals. Because intervals really are uh, paramount in music theory. And that is uh, a great line. So we're going to incorporate that. Um, Steven, it's cool to see you on. Thanks for joining. Jack, as always, uh, it's cool to see you on. Uh, Rodney, uh, nice splash screen, worth having a copy. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, Jacqueline, <laughs> geeks, yes. We're going to music geeks. And uh, we're going to definitely get into some of the core stuff of music theory, which is intervals. So um, a lot of times, and, and I've said this before, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Very cool, Wendy Davis. I'm glad that you're here. Thanks for joining. So music is easily misunderstood as being about notes or the pitches that you hear, the sounds, the actual sounds of music. If music was like painting, uh, which it is in some ways, then it's easy to think of painting as the paint on the canvas, just like music, the notes are the canvas, uh, the, the paint on the canvas of air that we play with. But really what makes the notes, the individual pitches have meaning is the intervals or relationships between those notes. So we're going to be talking about intervals, the gaps or spaces between the notes that give context to the content of sound. And while music is uh, about intervals and intervals are super important. They're paramount. As I say, it's actually <laughs> ironic that the symbols we use to convey what those relationships are to communicate the idea of intervals are confusing. They're actually really confusing. So let's jump in to what we're talking about here. And we have a diagram here that is a compilation of different interval names, actually note names and interval names in music. So <clears throat> the terms we use to reference uh, notes, uh, all of the sharp and flat names for notes like C, C sharp, D, D sharp, and so on. Notice that all of the sharp names correspond with the black keys of keyboard and all of the just plain old letter names, also known as natural note names, correspond with the white keys. It's because music uh, favors the key of C. And you can see here in notation that this, this is called middle C. It's, it's on the line that's between the two staff lines in music notation. We're not gonna get into that here, um, but C is kind of like considered this central note in music. So uh, on top of that, we have multiple layers of symbols or terms used in music vocabulary that seems like a lot of jargon, but it's really not that complicated in that all of these are interval names. So whereas these are notes, these are intervals. So we have, uh, and we're gonna focus on these tonight, but the most common intervals are Arabic numerals or just your basic one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, along with some flat intervals, uh, sharp and flat intervals. Uh, and those also correspond with the intervals that you skip in the major scale. So we're gonna, we're gonna look at that in a little more detail. There are other intervals like do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, P1, which means like perfect one, a minor two, major two, and so on. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about those another time. And we have talked about those another time, but we'll dive even deeper later on. But these symbols right here, this is really what music theory is about because intervals, like I say, explain the context between notes. The, the numbers are super important because whereas each note, each pitch has a designated name, C is C, D is D, E is E, F is F, and so on, these numbers are relative or they uh, not fixed, they're variable in that any note can be one. 
we happen to align one with C right here because we're in the key of C, but we could take this grouping right here and we could shift it so that a one, the one also known as the tonic aligns with any note. And so numbers are really important. But if you look at it, if you just focus on these numbers, it's kind of weird. Like we have this one flat two, flat two, what the hell is that? That sure doesn't show up in regular math or in a number line that you're used to seeing. So let's, let's explore what these numbers are more because they are so important. So it's one thing to look at symbols in a line like this, in a number line, but music is not inherently linear. It's actually cyclical. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at music in what's called pitch space. And pitch space is basically just the 12 notes of music wrapped into a loop because music is cyclical and repeats itself. The one is, in this case, we're, we're going to focus on C being the one, but just keep in mind that all of everything that we're looking at here, all of these principles and patterns apply to every key. We're going to use the key of C as one um, as the example, but uh, C is one. It's We're like not caring about octaves in pitch space. You have, for example, C, C. Those are just a high and low version of the same note. Likewise, you could keep going up into high and low octaves. Pitch space, we get rid of octaves and we're just focusing on those 12 notes and the relationships between them. The relationships between them is the operative term. And Whereas the numbers, like I or sorry, the letters, like I say, represent the individual pitches, the numbers are what we're going to focus on here. And if you look at the numbers, it's like, okay, you know, you have, you have a one, and then I'm moving in a clockwise direction here. So we're rising up the chromatic scale, a half step away from that is a flat two, and then a half step up is a two, up, up, just meaning clockwise. Then we have a flat three, a three, a four, a flat five, and so on. Now, the pure numbers or just the integers without flats or sharps are what are in the C major scale. So if I'm just going to circle the notes that have just plain old scale degrees, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then back to one again. So you'll notice what we're what we're looking at here is a major scale. So whereas C, uh, starting on C and going up through every note of the chromatic scale sounds nice, but kind of aimless. If we just pick out the scale degrees that are just integers or just the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, has more movement and direction where C is the bookends. It gives context and the kind of tonal gravity to that pattern. Now, looking at the scale degrees, we're going to focus on the Arabic numerals here, which is just a fancy way of saying the numbers. So if we look at these numbers, you start on one, you go in a clockwise direction, you make your way up to seven, and then boom, you hit one again. That's weird. We're kind of used to it because if you look at, say, the numbers on a clock, from 12 o'clock, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 o'clock, and then it drops down to one again. And so we're kind of used to retrofitting numbers, which are inherently linear, to a cyclical pattern like a clock. And the same idea applies here. If we try to apply linear numbers, inherently linear numbers, to a cyclical pattern, there is this strange drop from seven to one, and then the pattern repeats again. And there's some cognitive dissonance there that you just try to avoid <laughs> thinking about. A lot of times, musicians just kind of take things for granted, but let's not take things for granted. Let's embrace our humanity and our ability to recognize patterns and make sense of things, and let's dive a little deeper. Now, if we look at this pattern here, what's interesting is that one, if one is the, the, the center point or the tonic, the point of resolution in our pattern, it's interesting that, you know, four and five, intervals four and five are far away 
physically far away from one and we have you know a flat two that's just you know two a flat two is a number that's close to one then we have a seven that is closer to one than four and five now mathematically if we were thinking of these numbers as having mathematical meaning as if we were to subtract you don't really subtract four and and five and one and treat them like normal math these are just symbols interval symbols that are representing spatial relationships and distance from each other the relationships from one another but if you try to slap on the traditional logic of math even just basic addition and, subt and subtraction you start to hit some mental roadblocks really quick because it doesn't make sense that seven and flat two are equidistant from one. What is up with that? Now it does have to do with that mental cognitive dissonance that we just kind of like forget that, okay, seven goes to one. All right. It's kind of like a clock. Let's not think about it. Let's think about it and see what is going on there. Why is flat two and seven? Why are those both a half a step from one? So, Let's go back to the linear format of the chromatic scale. And then we're going to come back to pitch space. So pitch space is awesome because music is inherently cyclical. So to look at music in a cyclical format like this is revealing. But right now it can kind of throw us for a loop. Pardon the pun. Because the, the linear numbers, like I say, are kind of conflicting with the circular patterns of music. So let's go to a number line or in this case the scale degrees rising up from c this is our, our tonic here and we go one let's see i'm gonna go one two three four five six seven and then eight is our octave really it's one flat two two flat three three four flat five five flat six six flat seven seven and then to eight that's what we just played in this octave right there so you can see that really the numbers do continue like if it was a number line we could keep rising up and up and up in fact we even get from one to eight to 15. 15 is two octaves above one so all of those c c and c are one, eight, and 15. We're basically, we're just, we really are rising up with the scale degrees. And the, the letter names are just repeating themselves because the notes are what they are. So, you know, from C to C, and then from C to C again is just another octave. So to look at this a little more cleanly, you can see how, and, and these lines represent increasing distances. Every Every half step, you know, incrementally, we're starting at one to two to flat three to three to four. Like we are rising up in half step intervals. Um, but what we have here is basically two, two octaves. We have this upper octave and this lower octave. So in this illustration, the upper octave is highlighted by these darker lines. And that is each of those is much higher or much greater distances than this, this area over here that has smaller distances between the notes. So just to say it again, to, I know I'm beating a dead horse, but let's give that horse one more lashing figuratively speaking. And we have a second octave that's higher and a lower octave that has smaller intervals between the notes. So, it can get a little overwhelming though when you look at the notes like this or look at the scale degrees and the intervals like this because it's like man it's like so many lines trying to like wrap your head around all of this can be a little overwhelming so let's look at the same pattern but we're going to uh make it a little bit more digestible a little more accessible so here we have the same pattern uh, well, actually, we're, we're getting to this digestible, but here this is just highlighting now instead the lower octave. So this is an octave, and then we have, uh, oh yeah, sorry, we have the upper octave up here. So kind of idea, now we're just highlighting one octave over the other. 
So now let's make this more digestible by looking at it with smaller lines, where now we're saying, okay, within this lower octave, they all kind of, you know, are from one C to the next, from one note that is the tonic to its octave. That's one grouping. And then within this higher octave right here, we're just doing the arches. So it's not like trying to span two octaves. It's just one octave at a time. And it does make it a little more digestible where you're like, okay, we're, we're dealing with just a repeating pattern. But uh, the repeating pattern, uh, whereas with the, the letters, it's, it's easier to make sense of things because they repeat. The numbers do not here. We're going from uh, one to seven. And then if we go in the second octave, we are, we are going from one to seven again but we have a little more insight into the distance between intervals and why some bigger numbers are closer to one than smaller numbers. So for example, if we break it down even further, so now we're instead of spanning a single octave with a whole arch, now we're gonna span just half an octave. And what that does is it highlights the tonic and its tritone. So now, uh, and in music, a tritone is basically three whole steps. It's the, it's the furthest point that any two notes can be from, from each other. They're polar opposites. In color, we call them complementary colors. So red and green are complementary colors. They are polar opposites, or in music speak, they are tritones. And if you look at, let's center on this one, to get to it from its furthest point, uh, we have a half a step and then a whole tone and then a half, another half a step and then a second whole tone and then another half a step and then a third whole tone or a tritone. Tri just means three. So we have one tone, two tones, three whole tones. And so we're, we're moving away from one down to the left or if we go up a whole tone, up two whole tones, or up three whole tones. Another name for that is a tritone. Now we have, uh, we've made our way to uh, G flat or the tritone on the right. So you can see here that even within a linear format, we have this uh, symmetrical formation. So we have this symmetry right here between a uh, C and G flat, it's tritone, okay? So you can see here that one, if you go out a half step to the left, you have seven, because if we were climbing from this one up to this one, it is, you know, you could do the big arch to say, okay, that's a big interval from the low octave to the next octave up to seven, but really it's only a half a step away from the C up here. Likewise, you could say that this flat two is just a half step to the right from one down here, or it's a half step from one right there. So there's this symmetry between intervals around any given tonic. So on either side, flanking the tonic by half steps, you have a seven and a flat two. By whole steps, you have a flat seven and a two. A whole step and a half step, you have a six and a flat three. They are like mirror images in music around a tonic. Around the tonic at two whole steps, you have a flat six, two whole steps to the left, or two whole steps to the right, you have a three. Um, so flat six and three are like mirror images in music, inter intervally, intervallically speaking from the tonic. And then two and a half steps, you have a five, Two, uh, from the left and then two and a half steps to the right, you have a four. And those two notes are significant in that they're closely related to the tonic. Four and five are two notes that are harmonically very related to the tonic. And you can see it with, with the color. Red is closely related to purple red and red orange because of their relationship in the circle of fifths. They were neighbors in the circle of fifths. In the chromatic scale, they've been moved to uh, different positions. 
And then, like we said, there's a tritone or three whole steps to the left. You have a flat five, three whole steps to the right. You have a flat five. And then you could continue on, but we're just keeping it uh, between the tonic and this tritone. Okay, so we have this symmetry going on, which is really cool. Music is all about symmetry. I have other videos that talk about the symmetry of music. It's, uh, it's translational symmetry. It's rotational symmetry. It's reflectional symmetry. Music is symmetry. Music is geometry on steroids. Uh, and the steroids is really the cyclical nature of music. So let's look at this same pattern within cyclical pitch space. And you can see here, if we just follow the same pattern, you can see how it's increasing numbers from one to flat two to flat three to three to four to flat five to five to flat six, six, flat seven, seven. And then if we make our way up to the octave, instead of closing that loop, it really is like a spiral and that the numbers continue to rise up, numerically speaking, up to 15. So you can see how one, eight and 15 all align. When we looked at it over here in this format, um, you can see how this is really just a linear way of showing that same spiral to get from one to eight to 15. But seeing it within pitch space really does kind of help line up those intervals and see, oh, it's actually just, those are all just octaves of the same pitch. Those scale degrees or those numbers line up with the same note. Again, assuming that the tonic here is C, that one is C. Likewise, we can see how flat two, you know, if we're just staying within this inner ring of scale degrees is just, you know, right next to the one. And flat nine is an octave above that. If we continue going up, we have two is a whole step away from, from one. And nine is a whole step away from eight. So that's a whole step away from the octave. And this is a whole step away from the tonic. So two and flat and uh, nine, that is, are synonymous. They're just two ways of referring to what is essentially D. Now, or in this case, in the key of C, it's basically two and nine are just two ways of referring to the same pitch or the same note. In pitch space, we don't care about octaves. It's a simplified version. So we're not having to like, uh, it, when we're dealing with a number line, it is like a lot to take in because you're like, oh, I have to factor in every single octave because every octave is so important that I have to represent each note individually so that I can factor all that in. But if we get rid of the octaves and just allow ourselves to wrap the notes into a loop to then wrap our heads around the notes, then it's easier to, to understand. And we can continue on. We have three and 10 are just, you know, octaves of the same pitch. We have four and 11, uh, five and 12, six and 13. I'm just kind of focusing on the notes that are of the major scale and seven and 14. Um, so this is in essence what all of these numbers are referring to. And let's look at this. Here, though, most of the time, you just stick to the intervals that are within what's called, they're called simple intervals because they're within an octave. Just from one up to itself or eight, that, those are called simple intervals. Because much of the time when we're talking about music theory, when we're talking about uh, scale degrees in different patterns, like the major scale. The major scale is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's just within simple intervals. Uh, also chords, you could say that you have a chord that's built from one, three, and five, C, E, and G. That's a C major chord. And so most of the time we're just dealing with note formulas or scale degrees, interval patterns that are within a simple interval. But uh, as you get into extended chords, so instead of C, E, and G, we could add, you know, a flat seven and a nine and the 11. 
It's more of a jazzy chord, but that's basically a C11 chord. The 11 is because we're playing one, three, five. Uh, we added in a flat seven, we added in a nine, and we added in an 11 because we kept going up that spiral, playing into higher and higher octaves. And uh, that that's where we get into jazz chords. Extended chords are using these numbers that can seem crazy, like where do you get an 11? An 11, that sounds super exotic. Or you can go even up to a 13 chord or, or a flat nine chord. You can have a flat nine. What is that? It's, it's just fancy ways of reaching into these higher, this higher range of uh, octaves. And so whereas the inner ring is called simple intervals, the outer ring, these are called compound intervals. So we have simple, which are basically within the octave. And then we have compound. Am I going to have room to write it? Compound, which are the higher octaves. And they're just octaves of one another. Pitch space definitely helps clarify that because you can see how they align. And like I say, we're talking about the key of C, where C is one, but we could take this spiral and just rotate it relative to the notes. Uh, whoops. Uh, and just make one, we could, you know, rotate it counterclockwise by 60 degrees or a whole step. So one aligns with B flat. And then you can see that B flat uh, is the one, its octave would be eight and so on. Because the, the scale degrees, or pardon me, because the pitches, the note names uh, for, for notes, the letter names are fixed. They are what they are. C is always C, D is always D, E is always E. But the scale degrees, the numbers, because they're relative, they're, that's where the magic happens in music and the fact that we can have 12 keys where they all follow the same patterns. Once you learn these patterns in one key, you've unlocked how they work for all 12 keys because music is cyclical and symmetrical and follows the same principles. So uh, compound intervals, like I say, often don't come into play in scales, basic triads, major and minor chords. You never really get into compound intervals, but as you get into, I call them jazz chords. A lot of people call them jazz chords, but really just extended chords reaching into these, the higher stratosphere of scale degrees. Uh, it's not that music theory gets more complicated. It's just that the vocabulary expands into these compound intervals. They can seem more confusing that, than they are, but they're really fairly straightforward, actually. Uh, and they're to, to do an intentional pun, they are straightforward as long as you don't look at them <laughs> in a straight way. You have to wrap them into a loop back into their natural formation, which is circular like this. Uh, and... That is basically uh, an overview of simple versus compound intervals and how these scale degrees work. Um, I've talked a bit about in other videos, uh, the use of compound intervals in the circle of thirds and the formation of extended chords and how those extended chords are formed. Um, this isn't explaining that as much as it is just explaining the terminology used when we get to the circle of thirds, which is, accounts for and explains every chord that can be formed in a given key and mode. So I'm going to jump into the comments. Uh, that was some geeking out. Oh, uh, I do need to incorporate though, uh, <laughs> Dave, uh, your, your comment about uh, geeking out on relationships. So uh, to that point, if we look at these, if, if we see these uh, notes, the individual pitches as people at a party, then you know we can see that okay c is hosting the party and e is a guest at the party so e is three and g is five but using the the concept of rotating the scale degrees so that if we were to rotate these scale degrees so that uh b flat becomes the tonic then b flat becomes the host of that new party and even though the notes are the same their relative position uh, and and relationship to each other and basically the scale degrees, the role or function that they play at that party, the dynamics at play are different. Um, and so uh, whereas some of the notes, you know, might 
play prominent roles given their scale degree within one key. They might be, uh, in, for, for instance, F and G are the subdominant and dominant respectively in the key of C. In the key of B flat, they're not so prominent. F is, but G is relegated to being a six instead of a five. And so it, it takes on a different role. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to <laughs> parlay that into it's not me, it's you. Um, and there, there is the punchline is in there somewhere, but I, I haven't, I haven't moved it in as well as I'd like anyway, but I love it because it is about relationships. So I'm going to get into the comments <clears throat> and, uh, geek out with you on music. Uh, let's see. So, um, Hey Kathleen. So the one, four, five is like, uh, red, blue, and yellow. Um, and within, let me just jump to this pattern, get it back in focus. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the one, four, five is in terms of the way that I've applied the color here, the one, four, and five are the reason that the, uh, four is purple red in the case of C being red and five is red orange is because of their harmonic relationship in the circle of fifths. So those two flanking chords around the tonic are close neighbors harmonically due to the way that the scale degrees and the major scales form the circle of fifths. Um, and that the cool thing is, is that because music is relative, <clears throat> so j just to, to elaborate on that, so the the major three and the flat major six, yellow and blue, this perfect triangle is an, actually an augmented chord, which does have musical significance. Um, so there is some cool stuff going on there. If I were to rotate this and for instance, let's look at B flat instead, like we were saying, now E flat is four, F is five. The notes stayed fixed in relation to each other. And so did the numerals. It's just now that the relative alignment of numerals with the chords has changed how they, the, they function. Now I'm talking about Roman numerals, whereas in this diagram, we were talking about Arabic numerals, which are uh, referring to specific pitches. And in, in music, Roman numerals refer to chords. But the cool thing is, is music is fractal in the sense that the same, the same principles that apply um, at the micro level between individual notes, the, the scale degrees, the individual pitches, those same relationships are elevated and apply and connect. They form the bonds and the harmonic relationships between chords at the macro level. And as you get into chord progressions and all of that, those same relationships, it's, it's fractal. It's like those same harmonic relationships keep translating up at higher and higher levels. Um, so it's good stuff. Um, right on. So, uh, Good stuff. So uh, C major and A minor. Yeah, yeah. So C major is A minor. Yes, in, in terms of permutations of modes. So speaking of that, <clears throat> Kathleen, you make a good point, which is C is C, C major. So we could play <clears throat> the chords of C major. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one. If we keep this same formation, but we rotate, so we have the same grouping, but we rotate so that A minor is the minor one, then we have A Aeolian. It's the same notes, but arranged in a different way. So now that A minor is the host of this party, and therefore all of these other notes take on different different roles, different relationships within that new dynamic, uh, which uh, makes for the distinctive sound of a given mode and how all of these chords are related. Um, let's see. Okay, I need to throw this into Google Translate, but Richard, it's cool to have you on. Salut tout le monde. Um, I don't know what that means, but it sounds nice and i hope <laughs> it is nice it's cool to, cool to have you on um okay so uh walter long life uh to black metal um the cool thing about music theory is that all of these patterns apply no matter the genre which i love uh and yeah there's there's some good music in all in all 
forms. Uh, it's, it's the cool thing about music is that you can have the equivalent of like Norman Rockwell in painting or Pablo Picasso, totally different artists. And yet they're using the same basic principles of structure and form, color and dimension to create amazing stuff. And, and music is very similar. Hey, El Pico, yay. It's very cool to see you on. Thanks for being here. Uh, many vibes, uh, right on. And I love the sunglasses. They, they, it's a cool vibe <laughs> they have. Um, Delta Four. So why does uh, me make this more complicated than it needs to be? Um, I think he meant he. Um, music theory is all about patterns. There's an underlying geometry to all of this. And it's good to have you on. Uh, I'm just pointing out what it is. I'm, I'm actually not making any of this up. Uh, music theory is what it is. Um, just being able to see the patterns, which is music theory by definition, is to see sound. Theory comes from the Greek theoria, which means to look at, view, or see. So to, so to see sound, uh, if it's confusing, uh, hang around. It might make sense uh, as, you, as you take in more of this, but I'm uh, just describing what is there, which is, which is cool. Music is, the patterns of music theory are as magnificent and beautiful and awe-inspiring to me as they are as music itself. Uh, many vibes. He's just looking at it visually, Delta Four, and seeing the patterns and sharing it. Exactly. Uh, paraphrasing uh, the same the same idea. Um, all right. So, uh, what looks like a pocket watch to you? Did I miss King Music? Um, the uh, oh yeah the oh yeah I see what you're saying this this diagram oh it's not there anymore but yeah the cool thing about uh, oh it does kind of look like a pocket watch if we're referring to this. Um, the gears and the springs in it. And uh, it's, a, it's an apt metaphor in that seeing, you know, opening up the gears behind a pocket watch, you would see, oh, wow, th there's a lot going on here. Sometimes if you just want to tell the time, opening up the, the back latch and looking at the springs might be more than, than you want if you just want to know the time. But if you're way into the mechanism of how things work, which is what music theory is all about, it's not just to, you know, cram the G whiz file with factoids, but to apply these ideas into songwriting is ultimately the point. Uh, but speaking of Pablo Picasso, he said that you have to know the rules in order to break them. And so knowing how music theory works is not a wet blanket on creativity, but actually the lighter fuel to ignite that inspiration. Uh, and all of the greatest songwriters actually do understand music theory, if not explicitly or with the vernacular of a music theorist, but they understand it at least instinctively what those patterns and principles are. Uh, a lot of times they just don't like to divulge that they know that because it's not as sexy or as mysterious and cool, but it is nonetheless something that they know. Um, yeah, that's cool, uh, Kenny Music. So you could think of this pattern as a spiral staircase. Uh, yes, and the spiral is coming back to that idea of pitch space being cyclical. And if we, if we look at the spiral as, you know, increasing, it's a staircase, it is increasingly, you know, rising as we go. Um, but within pitch space, if we just loop it into a single loop, because the notes do repeat, even though the scale degree uh, numerals do rise, it's even easier to wrap your head around it because you're dealing with just 12 notes. And ultimately, those geometric relationships are consistent, uh, even not factoring in the scale degrees, just seeing, you know, the connections and lines between them. Um, Luke, cool. It's, uh, hey, it's cool to see you on. And I'm glad that you're here talking about music theory with us. Um, so F sharp, uh, uh, the one that gets loud. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I like it. Um, <laughs> and let's see. Uh, trails, is it correct uh, to call these chords fifth? Um, so in this context, and, and your comment, I might be missing what you're speaking to, but <clears throat> all chords within the circle of fifths in a clockwise direction, every successive chord is a fifth of the previous one. So, you know, let's look at <clears throat> A, it's five is E. E's five is B, B's five is F sharp, and so on. And likewise, B's four is E, 
E's four going in a counterclockwise direction is A, A's four is D, and so on. Uh, and the same, I'm looking just at the chords, the major chords within this inner ring, but if you look in the middle ring, it's the same circle of fifths formation. And in the diminished chords, this outer ring, it's the same circle of fifths formation. So it's consistent in each concentric ring. And uh, yeah, so the fifths, intervals of a fifth definitely factor in to music big time. Uh, Benjamin, can you explain why when we build chords like ninths, elevenths, and thirteenths, we use the flat seven instead of the major seventh generally? That is a great question. So let's look at that. If we have, you know, we're going to uh, use the key of C. So uh, C is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if we just pick out every other note, one, three, and five, we have a C major triad. And if we add that major seven sticking to all of the notes of that, uh, that key, then it sounds good, but that, that tense half step just below the one does add more dissonance because C wants to be where G flat is. They're tritones, they're polar opposites. Notice how C wants to be between F and G. That's where it was in the circle of fifths. Likewise, in reverse, G flat wants to be where C was between B and D flat. And you can see it with the colors. So C and its tritone G flat are very dissonant to one another. C and its two, the two notes flanking it, because they're close friends, if you think of these as, as notes, uh, as, as the notes as, as people or personify them, anthropomorphize the notes, then you have G flat, D flat, and B. Those are all closely related. And so C likewise is dissonant with the two notes that are friends with its polar opposite. That makes sense. So back to our major seven, basically if we take this C and bring it up here, those two notes are very dissonant. And so going a half step further, so it's a whole step below C, that flat seven is more consonant, slightly more consonant with C partly because C's close friend, subdominant F, is closely related to B flat. So there's, uh, it's, it's like a step removed. It's almost like the six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon or whatever. Again, if you think of these notes as, as people or the relationships between them, B flat is more closely related to C because it's closely related to its subdominant. So instead of one, three, five, major seven, we go one, three, five, flat seven. It has a slightly more appealing sound. And then if we just build on that, adding a nine and an 11, it sounds better than if we add in that seven, ah, it's just very dissonant. There's just taking in that flat seven just eases, takes a little bit of that dissonant tension away, um, which is why the flat seven is often used. And it's so, it's so common that Actually, musicians often just refer to a seven chord. They imply that it means a flat seven instead of a major seven. You go out of your way to say it's a major seven chord because it's just not as common as, as a flat seven, also known as a seven chord. Hopefully that makes sense. And thank you for your question. That was a good one. Um, trails. Uh, is it correct to call these chords uh, third, fifth, seventh, et cetera, depending on how many notes they cover within a mode? So... If I understand your question correctly, like in the key of A, we'll just stay in A, for example, we have, uh, this is the minor three is a C minor chord because it's built on scale degree uh, three in the key of A, which is C sharp. And C sharp has a minor third, so it's a C sharp minor chord. Um, and then the fifth would be E because it's built on the fifth scale degree and it's a major chord, hence a number case Roman numeral because it has a major third and so on. So uh, is it correct to call all of these chords third, fifth, seventh, et cetera, depending on how many notes they cover within a mode? So you would call, um, I would need a circle of thirds to show how we continue adding, but we can look at it here. We continue adding, starting on C, notes. We just continue adding them. So those upper, you basically name the chord after the highest, generally speaking, the highest scale degree that is included in the pattern. So, you know, basically 
you, you would call this a one chord, but it's really the one based on the root note of the scale degree that it's built on. And you would call this two chord a two because it's built on scale degree two. The three chord is not getting its name necessarily from which notes it includes, but on which scale degree is its root. Uh, that's, that's really where the name naming convention comes from. But then you also have a one seven chord, <laughs> or you have a two, a two seven chord. So it's scale degree two, and it also includes a seventh to its, its own flat seven, as if that were its own little one. I have other videos that talk about naming conventions with chords, and I'll do another video on that because it definitely warrants more focused discussion. Uh, and it's a great question. Hopefully my answer didn't confuse it. That's the weird thing about numbers in music is that the vocabulary we use to describe these relationships can actually throw more of a wrench in the works. But once you can see them, which again is the definition of music theory, uh, to actually see these patterns, uh, then it, it makes more sense. So I'll, I'll, I'll definitely circle back around again, <laughs> pardon the pun, to uh, naming conventions. I should do that one like very soon. Talk about that again. Um, oh, I lost my place. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, it's still blurry to me, but I think I understand it. Very cool. And it won't, you meet, and that's a good metaphor, it won't always come into immediate focus right away. Um, for me, getting into music theory is like this slow dawn where it's like, oh, you know, the light finally gets bright enough that I'm like, there it is. So um, I'm so glad you're here and um, I'm hoping that it, it is at least starting to come into focus uh, to be able to see it. For me, being a visual learner, uh, being able to see it really is helpful. Uh, so hopefully it does continue as we go. So Wendy, uh, when trying to improv, how do you know which intervals sound best to use? Is it just memorizing which relationships sound right slash intentional? Um, that is a great question. So improvisation is uh, definitely, you know, it's like improvisational dance, like knowing, having your footing and knowing where you can move and flow within physical space uh, is, is key. Uh, if you don't know if there's a cliff, <laughs> you know, if, if you dance too far to the left, you might, you know, fall and get hurt or worse. Um, it's the same with, with notes, like having your bearings and understanding your environment instead of physical space, it's harmonic space, uh, and knowing where, where those movements go and, and what it means uh, when you go and hit a certain note is, is about those relationships. And it comes down to knowing which notes to use comes down to certain relationships, geometric relationships between the notes. Uh, and it definitely takes the guesswork out of it and the memorization out of it. Once you see that, oh, there's a logic, there's a consistent pattern to this. Actually, lesson 16 of the music theory course is uh, like I'm, I'm diving in even deeper than I have uh, in earlier lessons in the course where it's, it's really using these symmetries to dissect the guitar fretboard in particular um, so that as you're moving around the fretboard, it's not hunting and pecking or just, you know, hoping that you land on a certain note, but knowing why you're moving that way, because there are these, these symmetries, these inherent patterns that are baked into the dance floor or to use our metaphor or the fretboard itself. Um, so uh, there are certain intervals to answer your question that are more consonant based on their relationships. And it has to do with the circle of fifths, which is like the uh, it's like a sonic electrical powerhouse that, informs all relationships within music. There's a special relationship between the circle of fifths and the chromatic scale. Chromatic scale being the pattern we actually use to play uh, different scales and chords. And so being able to see those relationships based on these symmetries is what informs those connections. Uh, I know that's, I'm, I'm gesticulating by waving my hands, but to see it in the patterns, um, it does, does inform. There is, there is a method to the madness uh, and uh, it's more than just memorization. There's music theory doesn't throw us a curveball. Mother Nature loves us and 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 gives us gives us a clear guide to it uh, through the geometry of music. Um, Uger, uh, how do you suggest approaching the path of learning the guitar with the colors and intrinsic relationships 
Do you have routines, practices, lesson structures to learn uh, the guitar from zero? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, at mycolormusic.com, there's a library of materials that has different playlists, theory, chords, all of that. There's actually a music theory course that starts at square one, at, at zero, assuming no knowledge. I've always hated uh, any, any professor or teacher in school where they're just like, they start a sentence with, of course. It's like, I, I actually don't have the context to understand that, of course. Could you explain it a little more? Um, and so, you know, in these live streams, sometimes I just have to jump into it. I can't give all of the background, but there is all that to say a course that starts with no assumption of prior knowledge, uh, specifically for guitar, though these same principles apply to any instrument. So if you play the keyboard, you could still go through it from lesson zero up to, I'm on lesson 16 right now of 20. Uh, and definitely check it out if you're interested. And it, it, it shows you how to apply all of these patterns. So it's not just pretty diagrams, but practical tools that you can use to enhance your songwriting. It's all about songwriting and, and just making music that you enjoy. Um, let's see. Um, Benjamin, you said makes sense because the major seven and minor second are so close to the tonic. Exactly. And their proximity to the tonic being flanking it by half steps on either side is it, it harkens back to that uh, relationship between the circle of fifths and the chromatic scale, which is fundamental to music. So if you look at C, for example, let's look at C. If we look at C, you can see that C is flanked by its close friends and neighbors in the circle of fifths, F and G. C, its tritone over here is F sharp slash G flat. Those are just two names for the same note. Notice that the two friends, the two close neighbors of its arch nemesis, if you will, are B and uh, D flat. The two notes that flank C in the chromatic scale are the two notes that are harmonically closely related to its most dissonant note or chord in this case, G flat. So when you include a B uh, in, in a major seven chord, you're bringing in, you're reminding C of that painful dissonant relationship it has with its tonic. Again, to personify the notes, it does help actually to think of the notes uh, as as people or in relationships, uh, because it's how it really works. Um, yes. Okay. So hopefully that um, hopefully that helps uh, my answer uh, about the guitar and how to apply these patterns. It's all about application and and bringing it into. It's like turning all of this information into a sonic pop up book, so that the sounds fill the air and it's not just stuck in your head. Um, let's see. Um, okay. So his frequency, let's call name. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, Mike George, does your chord map come with instructions in regards to the different color scales or perhaps you have a video explaining how to use it? I do have some, thank you for your question and for being here. It's cool to have you here. So I do have, um, videos that explain like how, what, what the rotations mean. Uh, in terms of, you know, you have relative modes or you have uh, parallel modes and, and what these funky ancient Greek terms mean, Ionian, Mixolydian, Lydian, it's a lot of syllables. What does that mean? And so I do have some videos that explain it. I also have a playlist um, at mycolormusic.com slash start, I think is there's like a playlist there that has like a, a, a beginner's intro to the chord map, it's a chord map playlist. Um, and then also in part five of the course, uh, when we get into, what is it like lesson 18 or 19, uh, going dissecting this at length, going to town into it so that um, you can navigate it to use the, the, dance, the dance floor metaphor so you can navigate it and dance around it with ease, which is what songwriting is all about. So um, yeah, check out mycolormusic.com and uh, there are posts also in the library that, that break this down even further with diagrams and videos. Um, thanks for your question. Uh, let's see. Alapico, I like anything uh, that you mentioned, even if it's just a smiley face emoji. Uh, <laughs> great with words and emojis. 
Um, let's see. Uh, Christian, uh, hey, will the stream be saved? Yes. So after the stream uh, is completed, it, it's on it's on the channel here. Um, and I also update the library with these links and the accompanying di accompanying diagrams that go with the videos. Um, will it be possible to watch later? Yes. Unfortunately, I have to go to sleep. Oh, wow. It's 2.32 uh, in your region. Thank you for being here. It is in the wee hours for you. So hopefully uh, you get some, some good sleep and this will be here for you when you rise. Um, let's see. Um, just jumping into the comments, going through the comments here. Um, I love it. Let's see. Okay. Skimming through. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting caught in, in the comments. So uh, it's not as interesting to just have me sitting here reading, but I, I got behind on the comments. Um, um, it's weird that Caged can set you free. That is a great perspective on it. I don't think I've ever thought of it that way. Um, I love it. Yeah, and uh, we'll talk more about Caged. I have some stuff on Caged uh, Chords. But that's totally true. Caged, of course, is an acronym for open chord shapes to play different inversions or permutations of a given chord up the fretboard. Uh, but caged can set you free. I love it. That's that is so insightful. Um, hey, thank you. Uh, I love I love the hoodie. I'm, uh, it's getting cold where I'm at, so I'm like, well, let's just reinforce the fact that it's cold. Let's put on some some cool colors. Um, all right. Okay, and then uh, I guess one thing that would be helpful, just as I'm kind of getting a feel for it, uh, the chat is if you have any comments or questions for me specifically, maybe put them in all caps. And that way, as I'm skimming through, I'm like, mm, that's for me to read. Um, uh, just so it, I'm not like pulling up a side conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not the only one who's behind, or I am the only one who's behind. I can just focus on the, the, uh, capital letters. That way, I'm speaking to the right stuff. I love it. Um, and with many vibes, caged was already in caps, so that j jumped out at me. Um, all right, let's see. Um, cool, his frequency, thank you again. I'm, I'm glad you're here. It's cool to have you on. Um, okay, so profile P, does any of it matter if I can't hear any music in my head? That's a good question. Um, it makes me think of, just speaking of that, the, possibly the greatest band name ever is Radiohead, which I learned is a reference or was pulled from a Talking Heads song, I think called Radiohead, um, where it's like, you know, the idea being that these these ideas are, are coming from beyond and, and being channeled in through the songwriter's mind and they're then converting it into reality. Um, so that's a good question. And... I think, I mean, I'm glad you're here and you're here for a reason, I would imagine, which is wanting to understand music theory. Uh, ultimately, I think if we're all honest with ourselves, no one picks up a guitar to play Stairway to Heaven and have that be their their peak. Uh, it's It should be the first step on their own Stairway to Heaven <laughs> to just run that metaphor uh, all the way. So I think all of us, if we're honest with ourselves, really want to create our own music. And um, I think, you know, music theory, a lot of times people poo-hoo, and I did this too, actually, when I first got into music theory, because I associated music theory I conflicted with music notation, traditional notation, and thought it was the same thing. And I was like, I hate notation. I don't want anything to do with it. That really is a wet blanket on creativity. And so it gave me the excuse to dismiss theory for a long time. Um, when really music theory is the lighter fuel on the fire of inspiration. And I think that as you get into these patterns and can dissect them and play with them and actually apply them in building scales and chords and progressions, which are all just permutations and rearrangements of each other, then those ideas may actually start, it may spur ideas and it may actually project itself into songs. So all that to say, I think it does matter. Uh, well, I know it matters, actually. And I think it really will help you. 
Um, and the idea is it may actually break a potential creative log jam. Uh, if you do feel like they're not coming to your head. Um, yes. So, uh, oh, that's a good one. Okay. Music. We need a chromatic scale emoji. Speaking of emojis. That's true. Uh, I'm on it. I think I'll, I'll work on something like that. Um, okay. Do you do finger style at all? Many vibes. Thank you for the all caps. Um, so I haven't really gotten into finger style myself. I love finger style songs. Um, I like one of my favorite musicians is Donovan. Uh, he's great at finger style, actually taught the Beatles that what they know about that. Like Dear Prudence was inspired by Donovan when the Beatles were in India and he taught them some of those techniques. Um, so I love it myself, but I haven't really gotten into it uh, as much. Um, but it's a beautiful thing. Um, <laughs> uh, I like in the parentheses. Uh, no, it's actually... The all caps actually is really helpful. So uh, even though you can get used to screaming because it really is helpful. Um, yeah, yeah. And El Pico, that's, that's maybe a good one too, is maybe just Mike. Uh, and that way I'm like, boom, because I, I do recognize my name. I'll, I'll answer to my name. So that may be a good way to do it too. I like that. Um, all right. So, <laughs> so the sudden urge to put what colors of banana in all caps. Uh, I read it even though it wasn't in all caps, but I, and I won't shout uh, <laughs> the sentences unless I get really excited about it. I'll just read it with a, a regular tone. Um, okay, so Lander Tube, you have to watch the replay. Also, I just got a tablet to use apps to learn to read sheet music. Very interesting. Definitely check out, uh, if you want to learn about music notation and sheet music, uh, lessons 10 and 11 in part three of the music theory course, break music, th music notation down and explain it in a way that I've never seen. Uh, I actually lost 20 pounds in the process of <laughs> writing those lessons because I got so immersed into things. Um, but uh, there's a lot of lot of things that can be missed with music notation or, or assumptions that can actually throw you for a loop. So I, I highly recommend checking out part three in the music theory course, and it'll help you. Um, okay, cool. So we are just at the hour. So I'm going to wrap it up and I'm excited to be geeking out, geeking out with you on the next one. Uh, and there are great comments. I always love chatting with you, geeking out with you on music theory. Music is the best. So thanks for being here and we will be talking very soon. I will see you. Bye.